continue to go ahead and continue to introduce yourselves in the chat. Thank you for coming. Today is our webinar is titled Measuring Impact with Open Educational Course Markings. I know we all have an interest in this, so I'm glad you're here. Our agenda today is to um, just a quick overview of what CCC OER and OE Global is. We have a panel of experts to um, tell us their stories about uh, open uh, course markings for open education. If you stay tuned for a few minutes right afterwards, we'll have information about upcoming, upcoming events and how to stay in the loop. CCC OER is a community of practice and we have webinars each month and a variety of um, committees uh, to encourage colleges to collaborate on our open ed programs, ensuring equitable access and success. We have about 101 members from 35 different states. I would like to introduce our new welcome to our new CCC OER program director. And um, if you'd like to say a couple of words, Heather, thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, a part of CCC OER and taking the reins from Una Daly. No one can replace Una, but I'm very happy to try and to work with all of you in the community uh, moving forward. And I'm very excited about this panel of practitioners and administrators on, you know, talking about such an important topic. Looking forward to working with you all. And Beatrice Canales will introduce our panelists. Thank you all for being here. If you'd like to put questions in the chat, I'm sure we'll have some time right at the end to answer any other questions you might have. Thank you, Beatrice. Do you want to take it away? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our December 13th webinar on measuring impact with open education course markings. My name is Beatrice Canales, an academic unit assistant from San Antonio College, one of the colleges of the Alamo Colleges District, and I will be your moderator for this panel. So that we're on the same journey, course markings are tags or attributes that offer students ways to customize their search for course characteristics. I would love to introduce you to a unique panel that will speak on their origin story regarding course markings in class schedules. Their origin stories will vary based on a student's experience, based on a journey of a community college district, and based on the work of the Idaho Board of Education. Thank you all for coming. And let me just introduce our panelists. Uh, Ms. Pamela Harrington Morarty is the Director of Universal Access of Instructional Materials in the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Success at the, Ac at the Alamo Colleges District. Dr. Jonathan Lashley, the Academic Technology Program Manager for the Idaho State Board of Education. And of course, Michael Valdez, San Antonio College's San uh, Student Government Associate Vice President. So. Um, we'll start with uh, Michael. Um, how did you begin your journey with OER course markings? Hi, everyone. So initially, I began my journey in my federal government class. My professor used um, one of the OER resources online. It's called OpenStax. So we had our federal government class that used that material. I remember my professor saying that uh, like students should have access to materials that not to pay for and free. So it was really nice. Um, so um, throughout the class, I got to actually, you know, look at my textbook um, by just going on the website and I had the ability to download the textbook onto my computer. Or if I was like um, doing work on the school computer, um, I was able to quickly and easy 
uh, find the textbook because it's it's online. Thank you. Um, and uh, Pamela, same question. Uh, great. Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm in a real, I'm in a new role here. I've only been at Alamo College's district for about five months now uh, as a staff member. And so prior to this, uh, I worked at a community college. I taught uh, developmental English and college success courses for 13 years. And uh, during that time, um, I uh, was an advocate of OER. And so um, in 2015, I believe it was, um, I was charged with redesigning a course that uh, I taught along with other colleagues. And with that particular course, I was able to um, adopt uh, OER for that particular class, and I was granted special permission to do so. Um, the other sections that were taught used a commercial textbook. And so um, with that institution, the institution did not use OER course marking. So I come to this kind of journey with an experience where there were not course markings to an institution now where we use course markings across the entire institution. And so I can say that, um, you know, in that in my history, um, I've I've learned how important it is to use course markers um, for uh, the student's perspective and also for the institution's perspective. And so as a, as a community college instructor using OER in my classes, uh, I did have a positive experience the first time um, using them because, you know, I had students come in in the first week of the term. Some of them had already purchased the textbook from the bookstore and some ha had not purchased the textbook. And uh, uh, at the time, <clears throat> um, I didn't particularly support the textbook that was being used in the class. Um, and I really found that OER broadened what I could teach in the classroom. And the students were very happy to be using OER. So it was very positive. I was able to tell um, the, I think there were probably like 10 students in the class who'd, who'd bought the textbook, go return your textbook. You know, I had permission from my dean to say, go return it, you don't need it. And then the others who um, we're planning to buy it, I could say you don't need to purchase it. And there were cheers in the classroom. Students were really happy about that. But I will say going forward in other classes that I taught there, um, I did hear about experiences where students would come to a class that was using OER, having purchased the textbook um, from outside the college, maybe from another student, former student, or another place where they couldn't return the book. And so that was wasted money uh, because the students did not have a way of looking up how courses um, or which courses were using OER, what the materials were. So I could tell that uh, for other sections, that was maybe a frustrating experience for some students. Um, and so uh, I'm very happy to move into an institution now that has been using um, OER course marking or, or a banner attribute since 2014. And so in the state of Texas, there's legislation that requires um, OER courses to be marked. And so this is to, uh, you know, uh, help students um, be able to identify courses that don't require the extra cost of instructional materials. And across Alamo Colleges District, um, the five colleges are um, ind individually accredited, but work together as one institution. <clears throat> and they all use a single attribute, which is AOER. And that really enables students to be able to look up classes that use OER in the course schedule, but also equips the institution to be able to track which courses are using OER to compare how OER may gain or where they when they may wane or which um, courses uh, maybe use OER um, at a particular time period and then shift to something else. Um, so I think it's really helpful and it's a contrast to what I've seen before in the previous institution where students were happy or frustrated um, and that institution still does not track OER uh, courses by the, the schedule of classes. There's still not a systemic way that uh, the courses are tracked. And so I see benefits in it, but also, uh, and maybe I'll talk about this more with other questions. I see some areas to grow as well too. So thank you. I suppose it's my turn. Um, and thanks Pamela, I think that uh, being a segue, it's almost like the organization of panelists was intentional in answering this question because I have the uh, unenviable task of representing faithfully 
Uh, Idaho has eight public institutions. We have four community colleges and four universities. But uh, my story is at the institution level and actually at a community college in Oregon. Um, but I think it's also quaint because Idaho's story around course sharing really starts at the institution level as well. So for me, uh, my first faculty role was in Central Oregon. I think I saw Saint, uh, Amy jump on. So uh, I was there for a few years and we had an independent bookstore at the time I was faculty there. Uh, the nature of my students in a rural part of Oregon that casts a large net is that uh, they certainly had needs as it related to access of materials, especially as it related to when financial aid might be released for many of these students. And so I worked with our bookstore to uh, pilot just a means of informing students, not only what the cost um, or, or where students could get materials in the event that there was a cost associated, but also descriptively providing more information on if I was using online, uh, public domain, open resources, where they could access those, and also what that meant in the nature of my class. So I was a writing teacher, and anyone who's dabbled in open pedagogy recognizes that it's relatively constructivist pedagogy, and it's also if you studied writing studies, you know that it's a long form way of what we do. Um, the co-authorship of knowledge with students is something that has long been an integral part of, especially the first year writing classroom. And so uh, fast forward to 2017, I moved to Boise, Idaho to work at Boise State. Um, I naturally have by that point learned about the open education movement as we now know it, uh, OER, open pedagogy and so on. And I was heartened to find that uh, I had other colleagues at the institution who were also interested in OER. They just weren't necessarily meeting on a regular basis. And then Idaho is a very small state. Um, we have 56,000 full-time students, roughly. And what that also means, though, is that across our eight institutions, typically, if you're doing work in libraries and academic technology, like I was, uh, if you're teaching specific courses that are common between multiple institutions, uh, chances are you're going to connect with one another. And so we started forming regular conversations around how can we support one another, recognizing that this is still an emerging topic. None of us had OER, open education, our job descriptions. How can we raise awareness? And importantly, how can we also capture the authentic needs of our students? Because ultimately that was always the goal is how can we recognize that every institution that we might share students, that there might be pathways between institutions, ultimately, we need to listen to the student voice first and what they need in terms of the information on hand at time of registration to make informed decisions. And fortunately at Boise State, we already had a governance structure around academic technology where we had representation from our student council. And what was great is that we would have a representative that would go through these meetings with us throughout the year. They'd want to see information provided in the learning management system, maybe top level notifications in the student information system about what the real cost of these course materials are going to be. Uh, and then they get super energized, they get very excited, and then like clockwork, they would graduate. And so one of the first tasks we had was really connecting with these student leaders and empowering them to not only document um, the initiatives that they care about in course, and, and course marketing was one of them, but then also work with the upcoming generation of candidates to put OER and course marketing as part of their platform that they were running on so that you had continuity in these initiatives of student representation. So beyond that, um, Boise State, we started meeting and, and convening as committees. Other institutions started forming committees as well. Uh, but what we also learned from talking to faculty and students directly is that OER is a great means to an end, but it's not an end in itself in addressing access and affordability issues. We had really cunning interest from libraries and innovative ideas around just better utilizing um, library access that we had. We had opportunities to um, better use public domain resources and, and ultimately try and form common definitions around cost, around openness, around the pedagogical implications of that, all in service to educating upward eventually, because now I'm at the state, I've been at the state board um, roughly six years now, and the benefit of that is that we still have a robust community of practitioners at all of our institutions who are informing various important things to help scale up this work. And, and the biggest one arguably is our policy 3U, which I just posted into the chat. Um, this board policy by its name, it's focusing on 
course material access and affordability, but a mainstay in the criteria there, both the optional and what's expected of institutions in developing plans in accordance with the policy is having strategies around course sharing. And it's around the information that students and faculty specifically want to share and so, or want to share and want to know. And so that's not just what is OER or what is the very low cost price point that's required, but also things like um, uh, what's often referred to as inclusive access, but we refer to as automatic billing programs because we don't wanna cede that rhetoric to them. And so that's the, the quickest and dirtiest storytelling I can give about what's happening in Idaho. And I would also just encourage, I'm, I suspect this is for my other panelists, but uh, if anyone in our limited time today has follow-up questions, please reach out, I'm happy to share more. It's also important to show everyone uh, the journey is um, starts and has ebbs and waves. So um, I think it's important to have everybody's background and how they came across the the courses that have these um, these uh, attributes to them. So um, my next question is um, for Pamela. Um, how how do students know that the course they choose has a free book if the marking has an OER as an identifier? So uh, I'll share my screen a bit to show you from the schedule of classes how uh, the courses here at Alamo Colleges are, are marked. Um, and let me make this full screen here. So uh, you'll see here that this is just a screenshot of the schedule of classes at Alamo Colleges District. And so uh, we use the banner here. This is the class schedule search. Uh, down toward the bottom of the page is where students will see an attribute field. And within that attribute field, there is an option to choose Alamo Open or Open Educational Resources. Uh, I, I know that this is a way that uh, when you select this particular field here and choose a subject, you can see all of the sections that are using open educational re resources. However, when I say I think there's some areas to grow here, I'm not quite sure that this is always clear to a student that it's kind of buried down here at the end of this list um, where it says location slash attribute. I'm not also not quite sure that the word attribute makes sense to a student. Um, and I think this is an area in which we need to kind of figure out how to message to students, how to <laughs> make it clear to prospective students to how to identify OER. Um, materials for courses. And this also um, is kind of black and white as well, too, is because uh, with the state of Texas, it's required to mark courses that use exclusively OER. And so choosing this attribute would provide students just with a class that doesn't have any commercial materials. But I know we do have some courses uh, um, um, that maybe use like a small reader, like a, a $10 book, and then um, use OER to replace larger textbook materials that traditionally would cost students, you know, 100 to $200. Um, that's not clear to students here, too, about how to identify those low-cost courses as well. And so I think in this case, Alamo has some growth to, to, to make. Um, but when students do go to the sections using this attribute, they'll see within the description of the course, and uh, depending on the course, it's it sometimes is in different places too. They'll see somewhere where it says this section utilizes OER. Um, it, it, this may not, may not also be quite clear to students. I think many students know what OER is, but others do not. And so it's not quite clear that this is free materials to a student as well. And so some areas to grow as well. There is some messaging on Alamo's uh, websites. And so this is from one of the colleges, uh, Northwest Vista, that informs students about what OER are, uh, what that means. Um, and I think we're still kind of working on ways to further inform students. We're in kind of a uh, an interesting, or I guess what I would call a tricky situation too, because um, with Alamo Books Plus, we're in a partnership with Barnes and Noble College where um, students receive rental materials for classes that use those commercial products. And so students don't pay extra for their instructional materials at Alamo Colleges District. Um, Alamo Books Plus is supported through student tuition. 
Um, and so uh, with this partnership that I came into in this position, um, OER are included within that agreement. And so all student tuition goes to funding Alamo Books Plus. And I hope that going forward, we'll be able to enter in with a, uh, a different contract to where um, OER only courses will not have that tuition charge to them. Uh, however, I, I am not the person who has control over any of that. That's just my own personal hope. Um, so I think Alamo is doing a good job in um, trying to inform students, but there are ways to grow. Uh, Alamo also um, in the state of Texas is required to publicly post course syllabi. And so within an instructor's syllabus, um, there's often language on OER um, courses that says, see your instructor to access your open educational resource for this class, or the OER is posted within the learning management system, so within Canvas. Um, so we don't right now really have a central repository for OER. So that's another place that we could grow. You know, having a place where students could look at the materials in advance, right? Be able to kind of peruse what Alamo is using for OER uh, would be very helpful. Right now with a class that uses commercial materials, students can, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, preview that material by searching for it online to kind of see what they're getting into. But without a repository for OER, there's not those options to be able to see what a instructor is using in their class. And so I see both pluses and minuses um, or areas to grow here that would be helpful. And so let me, uh, sorry, stop sharing. <laughs> Hi, Michael. So um, in your beginning, your origin story, and now we're at a point where <clears throat> you recognize um, how the attributes um, look at your, um, with regarding your schedule, um, what are some, um, you know, what is the next level for someone as a student in your role as a, as a student leader? Uh, so after being involved in the federal government class, um, kind of got me thinking to see like um, when I'm actually registering for classes, because before um, you would just, just pick a class, but you didn't like investigate like what kind of material it's, it, what kind of material is being offered for the class. Um, so now um, I'm looking through and seeing like the different attributes, like is it Alamo Books Plus or is it Open Education Resources um, that are going to be used in the classroom? Um, I've been in the talks with the Student Government Association because um, we did um, we did learn about OER uh, like a few meetings ago, um, so it's kind of like on their mind right now. Um, so we're we're thinking of doing a student guide um, to tell our students on our campus um, that there's different um, different course course markings um, for the classroom, such as open education resources. I know um, here here on our campus for um, it's a freshman course. Uh, it's called um, learning development. So in that course, um, like the faculty and some students actually helped like create that course book. Uh, so there's already a little bit of talk about um, some of the students. There, there was like a student advice section and actually our, our parliamentarian for student government, uh, they wrote an advice section. So it's it's nice to notice right now that the students are aware of like um, this type of material and we can use it um, as a way to promote it for the future. Thank you so much, Michael. And um, Dr. Lesh. Yeah, thank you. I feel like a lot of my comments are just gonna be plus ones to what I'm seeing coming across the chat because um, like for instance, as Amy just pointed out, students choosing courses, they want information, they don't necessarily need copyright licensing info. And that is something that in serving um, students getting a sense of what faculty were doing and what was possible within our system. In the development of Board Policy 3U, um, we realized that it was probably more important for us to set common standards than common standardization, recognizing that the ecosystem, the software ecosystem, the policy ecosystem, the professional development resources, um, and just the general awareness on campus varied by campus. Um, not only that, but board policy in Idaho, though all uh, the four-year institutions uh, directly report to our state board of education, there's an indirect reporting line with our community colleges because they, of course, have local boards as well. 
Um, and so the goal was how can we build a policy that um, not only will reach some of these goals that we have for better informing students and building awareness, importantly among faculty and among staff at the institutions, because there's also a data integrity issue with course marking where we need to know reliably that these courses that say they're assigning OER or very low cost materials are actually consistently assigning these materials if we're going to put forward that information. And um, I've, I've done research, I know others have done research as well, that sometimes the people who are responsible for inputting that information either to the bookstore or to others on campus, um, they might not be teaching class, they might be administrative assistants, they might be course schedulers. And so how can we build awareness about not only what are the levels of cost that all of our provosts worked on um, agreeing on with their faculty and their um, faculty leadership, but also how can we reach students in ways that are communicative, uh, that are multimodal in approach. And so it's not just um, annotating within an SIS and there's multiple different SISs that are currently being used at our campuses in Idaho, but also um, when does this information get released? Does it get, get released as part of the course schedule, the policy sets forward that it needs to be available, um, readily available and transparent um, by, by time of registration for these institutions. And importantly, by having a standard but not standardization, every institution has been able to look at what makes most sense for our students, what are the means of communication that we have available to us, and how do we best engineer, um, again, a, a, an education as it relates to OER, because I think it's easy to get caught into the abstraction and really want to be protective of the terminology. At the same time, um, the number one thing is that we want to make sure that students have access to the required materials that they need to be successful when they need them. There's um, many um, conversations happening on the chat, <clears throat> you know, and the idea of identifying courses and how, in which way um, that would satisfy um, how a student views their course selection, how an administrator can track the different kinds of open textbooks, different open um, OERs. Um, um, down to, you know, the state reporting of this. Um, I think it's, a, it's really an interesting um, conversations that we're having here because it does affect a lot of, of um, you know, individuals who have a, um, a very particular part in their journey of trying to, um, you know, look at these courses in a, in a very, um concise viewpoint and and also to allow students that that choice of um finding the the correct um textbooks so that they can find the courses that um go with that so i i, I do like the this conversations and i and that just leads me to our um next um question um is um what did you learn once you started um, using the OER course markings or from Michael um, seeing the, the course markings. Uh, what is your advice or what is your feedback that you um, can, that you received? Um, what course marking data um, affects institutions that quantify the number of faculty using OER or OE practice, um, open education practices and open textbooks? Uh, Dr. Leslie, could you? Yeah, um, some of you on the call, maybe because there's many of you, uh, may be familiar with Jerry Handley. And I always like his piece of advice that um, any initiative like this, you want to be a gift and not a burden. Um, and as soon as the conversation moved to the state level in the state of Idaho, it's easy for it to become, well, this is a new reporting obligation. This is a new burden. This is new exceptional standards that we need to meet because the board is interested in this or because it's politically advantageous. And so that was one of the great luxuries that we had and that we already had an active practitioner community of thoughtful educators or education professionals that really cared about educational access and affordability for our students uh, is that we were able to work with them directly in co-authoring policy that was a reflection 
of existing priorities and practices among our education community. And I think the importance there, though, is that it's not a perfect policy. And none of our policies should be. These should be living documents. Um, what's been great to see, however, is as part of our policy, because every institution has to have a plan. Um, we are now three years in to getting uh, a plan and a report from each institution. And what we continue to see is movement. And importantly, what we continue to see is that the movement is positive. We're already aligned with so many priorities that the institutions already had for optimizing their systems, for better supporting their students, for building out professional development and scholarship of teaching and learning opportunities for their faculty. And to me, that's a reflection of like the community really did drive this. And the board's happy with it because the board set a policy that's still appropriate and accurate. And so, um, you know, in the case of you can't expect the policy to be perfect and you can't let perfect be the enemy of the good. The good here in terms of right sizing is again, making room for every unique institution to make it their own. And so um, you'll see in the, the policy that I posted, we have criteria that is required. Um, that's just the, you know, the bare minimum standard on the sort of information and opportunity we'd want to see to support these sorts of initiatives. And importantly, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, the board also has stakes in this. So I'm board staff. Uh, I coordinate and co-design with faculty across our state opportunities for faculty to build awareness, to get recognized, for students to find awareness and get recognized. I, I saw that my colleague Liza Long is on the call. And I mean, she's an expert at getting students involved with these projects, both in and outside of the class. And that is, I think, the most enduring means of us addressing not only the goals and establishing appropriate or exciting goals around open education, but us finding sustainability. Because we're talking about not just cost savings for students and course markings being a means of that, but course markings being, being a means of kind of meta education that happens before the class. So students also know what to expect, maybe pedagogically as they're learning about like, oh, these courses that are associated with zero or zero cost pathways or open resources that are initiated by state initiatives. That might also be an opportunity for me to have a more meaningful learning experience because I'm also gonna be co-authoring um, knowledge and perspective with academics. And uh, you know, personally, I, I'm, I'm biased because that's how I like to structure my class as an educator, but those are also the classes I wanted as a student. And so the fact that we have a systemic effort around that is, is really massive. And I think it's telling too that the community colleges who don't have to subscribe to this policy all willfully chose to because they recognize that their students are also, um, hopefully in many cases, gonna move on to our four-year institutions or gonna move on to different institutions within our state. And because we have these common definitions and because we have these shared programs, uh, they're not starting over and relearning, you know, what it's going to take to be successful if they move on to a different institution in Idaho. Lee, did you want me to go next? I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yes, Pamela. Thank you. Thank you. I was Great, mute. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. Um, so yeah, I really like what you're sh you're sharing, Jonathan, about like the investment that you're getting. Um, I think it seems like a much much bigger like uh, like a macro case to me, like I, what I hope happens here with the institutions in Texas. Um, I think there has been a lot of investment within uh, Alamo Colleges District to kind of talk about OER and to mark OER, uh, but I think there's still some room to grow for us as well here too. Um, and so like, I was thinking, Jonathan, about what you're sharing about not only is it the cost savings for students and like um, focusing on that for sustainability, but also like the ownership of a mat material. Um, and I, I think that that's something that I'm really thinking about for Alamo colleges too. I mean, we're in an interesting situation here with the Alamo Books Plus um, program and the tuition model contributing to that to where students are not really maybe looking for classes that will save them money as far as instructional materials because it's a standard kind of tuition model paying for all and that kind of changes a little bit maybe the ways that faculty and students and administrators think about OER. Um, and so what I'm really like thinking about as far as what I've been learning and what that means for the institution here um, is that uh, 
that there's some work that needs to be done in talking about ownership and talking about what uh, kind of content can students help create with faculty and what kind of content is best for our student population and how can we make that um, transparent to students as well. Um, I was looking back at some of the questions in the chat too, and I think I can kind of address what I'm learning, answering those questions as well. And so with Alamo Colleges, um, kind of the people that are responsible for um, the co course marking, that's a relationship between the faculty um, department chair and the uh, course schedulers. And so Alamo um, each year, um, you know, uh, copies over the sections that were taught from the previous year. And so it's very important for the department to work together to make sure those courses are marked correctly. So if a course is no longer using OER, the a OER attribute needs to be removed from that section, or if a faculty member is um, adopting OER instead of the commercial materials that is placed on the section. Um, and we are in an interesting situation where we have these two, um, two systems that we can use to compare to each other. And so with the uh, with the Barnes and Noble um, adoption portal, faculty uh, chairs update that as um, section information changes. So say for instance, a faculty member is removed from a section, another one is added in, then we can change that uh, instructional materials adoption. You know, if it was a commercial material, we can switch it to OER or vice versa. And we're able to compare the two systems together. And so we're in a process now. I mean, I'm very, I'm very new to this position. This really is my my four and a half months of working here now. But moving into this new year, we're moving into um, developing a process to compare the two systems together to ensure that what we're sharing is accurate, you know, accurate to students and accurately captures what is happening in our courses. Um, we, uh, the billing relationship with uh, our partner is that on census date, that is when we are, we send over information to Barnes and Noble about the sections that are um, included in Alamo Books Plus, and that's complicated by our dual uh, credit program as well, because some of those high school program classes that are taught at the high school campus are not included in Alamo Books, um, and so we're not charged for that material um, by the Barnes & Noble partnership. And so there's a lot of details that have to be figured out in all of these different systems working together, but we are able to change the um, information about the course up until the census date. And that doesn't complicate things for students currently as far as charges for course materials, because again, they're not paying extra for commercial materials, but it would complicate things if we um, change our OER sections so that they're not part of that tuition. So that would again complicate things because then you may have a student who has chosen a class um, because it uses OER and then if it adopts the commercial materials later, then there's that tuition charge that's going to the program. So it's very complicated to figure out when you have all these pieces. And so I, I'm, I'm learning that that relationship and this program complicates things. Um, and I'm also learning that there's really a unified effort behind the um, the markings where there are many people involved in the system. And anytime you have a system, there's always going to be issues that occur, right? And so finding those issues and correcting them is something that we'll have to do going forward. And <clears throat> thank you, Pamela. Um, it is interesting because of what Pamela said. I am a, a course scheduler. And um, whenever we get a list from um, Barnes & Noble that said the faculty decide to go uh, OER, we uh, have a list that we automatically have to look at the course schedule and banner, um, and then we, we change it, and it goes live. So as soon as we get that notice, anything we change in banner, it goes live for the students. So um, that's immediate, but we do have usually before go um, before the schedule goes live versus before before students can register. So students can see the schedule before they can register, right? And so we still have changes all the way up to when they can start registering, and even even behind that, before it even goes live, we usually have a you know some couple months to to look at the schedule before that. So. 
there is, um, yeah, I, I also saw that, you know, question, you know, like how far in advance, you know, when faculty gets switched, be, you know, um, so there is a lot of moving parts. Um, I would um, love to um, end our um, question and how we started is how we will end it with our student leader, um, Michael. Um, what is some advice from a student point of view? Um, what um, can you think of that can help all of our conversations revolving around um, the attributes and um, for open textbooks? Uh, I was also looking at the chat and I noticed like a lot of people were talking about rentals, like book rentals. So that got me thinking, um, like um, kind of now that the semester is ending, we're getting emails like, oh, you need to return your book. Here's the deadline. You have a few more days. Um, so we're getting that email and then we have to go like right after, I guess, so that the rentals can be ready for the next, um, the next um, for the spring semester. But like um, some advice is for students to understand, like um, there are these two different the Alma books plus here, but um, to understand like open education resources, um, that's gonna be available for you like the first day of class. And after, after the course is over, that's your material. You get to keep it, you know, you get to keep it after the class. You don't have to return the book uh, like um, you're currently doing. Um, just want like students to understand, you know, like times are changing. Um, probably like what the, their faculty member, like they're probably back in the day, they would purchase their book or have to return it. Um, but I want students to understand that times are changing um, and uh, making open education resources, like looking for that material, uh, make it change with them. Um, Cause like OER re resources, um, they can be like material, like um, here at the Animal Colleges, we're thinking of developing um, like the courses, like to have like the faculty write the book and especially some of the students. So, um, you know, like that's like a big game changer, you know, like having someone that sat in your seat, um, like develop material for you to read, like how, how great and awesome is that? How localized it is. Yeah, that is true. You know, um, some ways it is beyond cost. If you think about the, the student's investment um, in open pedagogy, um, and which is what Michael, when he was talking to me about, and I said, you're talking about open pedagogy and that is um, part of the open educational practice. Uh, well, I just wanted to say um, thank you for our panelists for your time and and that you passed on your knowledge and experience on course markings. Um, this continued work reminds me of the Lao quote that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And um, thank you so much for um, talking to us about your journeys. And um, I think we may, do we have time to address any specific questions? Liz or Lauren? Yeah, I, I, we ahead. definitely have at least 10 minutes. I I think okay. maybe more. Um, I think Lori Beth just um, turned on her video. So I think she's going to ask some questions from the chat. Yeah. I think actually uh, it, it sounded like you guys were monitoring the chat at all uh, together. Um, and I've seen other people offering answers in the chat. That's wonderful. Um, let's see if there's a question. Um, I think you addressed this a little bit, but um, maybe you want to speak to it again while we watch for other questions. Um, you know, what happens when the student selects a course and then the schedule, the faculty schedule assignments change and the course designation needs to change very quickly. Do you have any, any thoughts on that? I can, I can speak to how we've tried to address that a little bit from uh, state support of our institutions. And this is also, I think, the benefit of having multiple institutions working closely together um, on a, a shared initiative or shared task. And so our community colleges are currently um, all in the process of developing uh, zero textbook cost pathways um, for, through entire programs. And the benefit of that is the courses, even if they change sections, even if they change instructors, they're still going to be using the same course materials. And so having those Z degree de designations 
help inform students of like, okay, that's not going to change. That's not going to be disruptive. Um, also, previously, I was the, the chair of our statewide general education committee. In Idaho, like many states, we have common indexing among our general education courses. We envy states that have common indexing across more than just their gen ed, but we'll take gen ed um, as a great opportunity to really realize impact in this space because typically gen ed courses are required, high impact, high enrollment. Um, and therefore, you know, students are really gonna feel course material changes, especially if you're adopting fully open solutions. And the value there is um, it takes only one uh, industrious faculty member who's teaching uh, Math 108 or English 102 to adopt OER, um, to inspire others to adopt OER. And if it's being used at one institution, that same class taught at another institution in Idaho is just as um, capable of adopting those materials. And, and what we found naturally is that different faculty adopt different materials. Um, and so we are increasingly getting more and more of a selection of open or low cost resources uh, to choose from for a variety of these common index courses. And so actually looking ahead to the future, that is the next project I think for the state is how do we bring in as part of a referatory that's specific to our state, um, those open materials that are actively being used and curate them in a way that people can search and pull from that way, again, we're further minimizing that sort of variation or that disruption when um, when course schedules change. Mm, that makes sense. Um, we had a question here. Kimberly would like to know, Michael, what you think, uh, what would get a student's attention beyond the textbook course materials um, as you're searching or registering for classes? Um. What, uh, I would say um, what gets the attention, maybe um, like seeing like what's in the book. Um, I know like if I saw like one of my friends like was a contributor to the book, you know, that would really interest me. So um, seeing like who developed the book um, would get my attention because uh, it is important like free textbooks, but you have to go like above that. And I would say another thing to get to your attention is, um, you know, textbooks free but you get to keep the textbook like you know after um, the course ends so uh, I guess like sense of ownership would get get your attention excellent answer oh things I hadn't even thought about um there was uh there was a question in the chat and I'm curious about this myself um how how can we find out how many students or which students um, are registering for a ZTC course or a course within open ed? How do we find out um, who's, uh, who's searching for what? I don't know if um, you have an answer. Thoughts? Well, I know that <clears throat> our institutional research teams have access to the data that we utilize. I know our district, um, they have um, a more, yeah, that's from a college point of view, but Pamela is from our district office who has access to all data at all five colleges. So that um, kind of knowledge and access is vital when <clears throat> you're looking at grant work, are you looking at, you know, you know, how are we going to, you know, react as a single district um, to all, um, to certain issues. And I know that that is um, something that um, is vital and is important. And um, in when deciding um, what can affect all five colleges is, you know, if we change anything in the attributes, <clears throat> it affects all the colleges, all the classes that have this attribute. And um, we we can have up to, I believe, five or six attributes um, to our schedule. So we can have various layers of attributes. And like Pamela showed, you know, the, the last attribute that a student can see is the OER. 
you know, that's the last. So um, in a in a in each class, you can have all these different kinds of layers. But I don't know if Pamela, you wanted to speak from a, a district point of view. Uh, I haven't personally used it yet, but I've attended other in, uh, presentations on course marking where presenters spoke about being able to see how many times uh, unique searches have been done within Banner or with other systems. So I think that's a very interesting question to try to determine how many how many times a student, a unique unique person and unique uh, uh someone visiting the site, prospective student, I guess you would say, is uh, searching for that particular attribute. Uh, we, I don't, to my knowledge, we don't have that information here at Alamo Colleges yet, but I think it may be helpful to be able to tell if students are using that field um, and if at all possible, what they select then based on that search. Um, and so that, that's something new to me to think about too, and how to, how to do that here. Um, we are like like B, you just explained, we are able to tell how many students register for sections that use OER versus others. Um, uh, in my role, I have not done that yet to compare which courses fill more quickly versus others. Um, in the situation here in which students, their tuition is paying for the instructional materials program, I'm not quite sure if that's something that's motivating them or if we need to, um, you know, do some more work on the messaging on why someone would select an OER course like uh, Michael has talked about, right? Like the different reasons for choosing OER courses. Um, uh, that I just have lots of questions and nothing that we've really done yet to answer your question, Lori. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, it's a really good question. And I'm seeing a few answers um, popping up in the chat as well. Um, oh, one other question. Um, maybe we have time for one more question. <clears throat> uh, what about printing? full books. Um, I think that's a question that's been asked in a number of webinars. Um, what do you do with cost of printing or how do you how do you do that? Uh, the name is that? not coming to me right now yet, but I know that there are some programs at Alamo Colleges that work with um, a print on demand publisher um, and that those costs are included within the Alamo Books model. Uh, so students do not pay any extra money for the printing of those OER materials. Uh, so that's been the solution here for courses that uh, require printed versions of OER. Um, I know that's not maybe a situation at other institutions that don't have this tuition model. So I know it's a it can be a challenge then too that can um, you know, be placed upon the student to print. Uh, I know that can be uh, a situation, but here at Alamo Colleges, we do at least have the benefit of being able to print through our partner. Yeah, it, it really depends by campus on how they're approaching it in Idaho, though, you know, some have print quotas that have been up. Some have been managing this primarily through either the library or the CTL or the, um, uh, accessibility services offices in, in coordinating around students' needs. One tactic that we did take, though, that's sponsored by the state is that every institution in Idaho has uh, an enterprise access to, and this is, this is true for students, faculty, and staff, to Pressbooks as a platform in any of our professional development um, initiatives in the state leverage Pressbooks as a means of visual authoring, um, not because we think that textbook is like the ultimate means of knowledge transfer and transmission, but um, as I mentioned earlier, especially with common index gen ed courses, what we've found a lot of success with is developing what we consider more modular um, open textbooks through the Pressbooks platform that has content that can be clone to an institution environment and faculty can add or subtract materials. And then what's so nice about that platform is that it has a lot of different portability options to either go to a third party for printing uh, where institutions are supporting that or to just print on demand on their respective campuses. Thank you. I'm wondering if we should probably get to those uh, few final slides. And if you don't mind sticking around for a minute, we do have a survey that we really, really appreciate you filling out. Go ahead, Beatrice. 
So um, thank you everyone for attending today's um, webinar. Some great information has been um, given and I love the community that we are in that shows that um, we all um, have great ideas when we pull together. Um, but this is our last webinar of the year. Uh, the rest of the webinars are archived uh, along with this one. Uh, but I wanted to let you know that the, um, there will be an announcement soon about the spring webinars um, in January. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, please let us know how we did today. Uh, please take this short survey. Um, the link will be um, given to you on the, the chat soon. And we just wanted to make sure that uh, we hear from you and we hear your voice. And if there's something that uh, you want us to address um, as a webinar for next spring, please let us know that as well. Uh, we thank you. I want to thank Pamela and Jonathan and Michael for your um, sage advice and your um, lessons learned. And, um, and let's say thank you. Thank you, everyone.